greetings from beautiful downtown Rockmark, Georgia. Beautiful day out there today. And my name is Stephen Gerard, evangelist. I'd like to uh, say Maranatha to all you Rock Martians out there. And if you're not familiar with that term, Maranatha, it's a, an old ancient Christian greeting, which means simply, come quickly, Lord. Our study today, lesson number two, is the beginning of end times. And uh, doing a little thinking and a little research on this over the last week, I'd like to start off with an unbiblical source. Somebody, everybody knows, Albert Einstein. He was a mathematician, physicist, and he wrote a lot about time. Here's one of his sayings. Einstein wrote that people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. So in other words, he said, time is an illusion. Many physicists since have shared this view that true reality is timeless. Einstein believed that both the future and the past are unchangeable and will play out exactly the way that they were meant to. And to a degree, the Bible agrees with that statement, that that which God has spoken will come to pass. Now there's an aspect of that that I, I take issue with and it has to do with the work that Jesus Christ did some 2,000 years ago on the cross. To the extent of the reality of what Jesus referred to as the new birth or new life, a new creature, that which he purchased on the cross with his blood, those who participate and become citizens and have been transferred into the kingdom of God, their future is going to be different. Now, from that point forward, as it is written, their future will unalterably play out the way God said it would, but it's a different future, a different destiny for those who have never put their full trust and obedience into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the title is The Beginning of End Times. So I have a little, little thing that I do with people I ask them a question. I say, if you want to study end times in the Bible, where would you go? Where would you start? And most people would say, the book of Revelation. That deals with end times. Well, it does. It does. But there's another aspect that I want us to consider. Let me start by talking about the Bible chronology. There were two men in the 1600s, John Lightfoot and James Usher, who did the first chronologic breakdown of time, starting from the birth of Jesus Christ and working backward with the Bible and ancient texts that described when certain kings lived and died and their, their reign, when they, when they were born, when they start to, to reign, and when they died, and so forth. And in both of their math, they came to a, a relative agreement that the time back to Adam was very close to six 
I'm sorry, 4,000 years. James Usher uh, said it was 4,004, and uh, John Lightfoot was considerably less, but he probably didn't have as much information available to him as did James Usher. Most scholars since then reviewing their work are in general agreement and most Bible uh, study Bibles that have a chronology of time utilize James Usher's work. Now as far as the universe itself, now this goes back to Adam, okay? There are many people today that believe that that's when the universe, when the earth was formed, six, six days prior. But scientists, creation scientists today have calculated through physics that the universe is actually between 14 and 15 billion years old. The Bible only concerns itself with the destiny of the man that God said, let us make man in our image when he created Adam. Now God reveals something really outstanding in this verse that we have up on the screen in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. Let me read it. Remember the former things long past. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, quote, my purpose, my plans, will be accomplished and I will accomplish or cause to occur my good pleasure. We have a similar scripture in Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. We don't need to look at that. It basically says the same thing. Most people that I have this conversation with about the chronology of the Bible and, and the return of Christ are not aware that the ancient Jewish rabbis called sages and the early church fathers or the uh, bishops knew about the length of days. We're talking about the seven days of creation in Genesis chapter 1 in chapter 2, the first couple of verses. Now they had an understanding. The Jews before Christ understood something. We're going to get to it in a moment. Based on Psalm 90 and verse 4, the rabbis understood that each single day of creation was representative of a thousand years. Now, don't construe that as it took God a thousand years to create the earth, a thousand years to create the animals, a thousand years to create the sun. No, it's, it's talking about the length of days moving forward. So, we read in Psalm 90 verse 4, says, for a thousand years in thy sight are like yesterday when it passes by. Now the early church fathers knew this about Jewish eschatology. And as well, they had a second witness that underscored this understanding found in 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 3 and 4, and the key verse is verse 8. 3 and 4 give us the overall context that when we read verse 8, we'll know what we're talking about. So Paul says in verse 3, Know this 
first of all, this is very important, Paul is saying, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. Now let's make sure we're not part of that crowd when uh, preachers today say they believe Jesus is coming very soon. There's a lot of people get out there and, and mock that message. And I understand why. Um, <clears throat> over the last 2,000 years, there have been many people come forth and set specific dates when Jesus was to come. None of them based it on the scripture that Jesus alludes to, and we're going to get to that by the end of this lesson, okay? So they mock because of all the false prophecies that have come and uh, not been fulfilled. But there's several good reasons why they have not, and I'm not sure that we can get into that as part of this lesson, but perhaps in one of the other lessons, I might, uh, might go there with you. They will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, quote, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Now, actually, uh, I really take issue with that statement because uh, this is the mocker speaking now, okay? But <clears throat> this is reflective of what's called in the scientific community uniformitarianism, that the earth has, uh, over the millions of years, slowly uh, progressed, uh, evolved, and changed, but the reality that we know from geology, uh, from astronomy, from the Bible itself, and recorded records in history is a uh, idea called catastrophism, that the earth has had catastrophic events that have altered the face of the earth. I was just speaking to one of the uh, people that's come in to see our video about the age of mankind. They lived to be 900 plus before the flood, and then after the flood, the lifespan dropped dramatically down to what it is today, which we'll talk about a little bit further on in our study. So they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? So the topic is Christ's coming and the last days. Those are two key phrases in verse 3 and 4. So now we have the context. So now let's go to verse 8. Okay? Uh, Peter says, if I said Paul, I apologize. This is the book of Peter. Peter writes, but do not... Let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. He's speaking to the church. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. Did you get that? It's an important part of his message. And a thousand years as one day. So he said it both ways, so there's no ambiguity about what those seven days of creation correspond to that's being played out in our lifetime uh, for the last 6,000 years. Centuries ago, up until after the Nicene Council in 325, there was a big shift that took place in the theology of the church and the government of the church and, and uh, the authority and all these different things. The early church called this Kiliism, reflective of the Kiliistic doctrine that kilo means a thousand. 
So they call themselves Kiliists, and there are many writings, uh, just to name a couple, Justin Martyr, uh, who lived from 100 AD to 165. Uh, he was two people removed from John, the apostle. Uh, the man that he studied under, studied under the feet of John the Apostle. And Tertullian, who uh, wrote between, or he ruled as, as bishop between 207 and 212 AD. Now, in the Jewish writings uh, called the Talmud, which is Jewish commentary, in the Tractate of Voda Zarak, on page 9, we read this. This world as we know it will only exist for 6,000 years, beginning with Adam. Well, let's do a little math, okay? We know from James Usher that it was 4,000 years from Adam to Jesus. And where do we stand now? We're 2,000 years removed from when Jesus walked this earth in Jerusalem, in Israel. So, in my, let's see, in my math, four plus two is six. Oh, yeah. So we're 6,000 years. We're at the point that the Jewish sages said, something's fixing to happen, folks. This the Jews refer to as the heptatic pattern. Heptatic is the number seven. The pattern is that there would be six days followed by a seventh day, which they call a day of rest. God worked six days. He created a man on the sixth day. His work was done. Everything before that, God said it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. When he made man, he said it's very good, and then he rested, okay? The heptatic pattern is the number seven broken down into a group of six, followed by one, a day of rest. And remember what we just read. Remember what the early church fathers believed and taught. In fact, they were so emphatic that they, they one of the bishops said, if any man doesn't believe in the literal thousand-year reign of Christ, he's anathema. He is out. Don't attend my church where I preach and teach. Go find some other liberal group that you can agree with. It got pretty testy back in the early centuries. So throughout the Bible, we see the heptatic pattern being replayed over and over, starting with the six days of creation followed by a day of rest. Then it was codified in the Ten Commandments. In the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath or the seventh day to rest. Do no work on it. The land was given six years. They were allowed to farm the land, plant and sow, plant and sow for six years. And then they had to let it lay fallow on the seventh year. And uh, I'm trying to think what that term is. If I think of it, I'll, I'll, I'll blurt it out during the study, but I can't think what that was called. Uh, and then, of course, we have these scriptures here that tell us that the church should know that these days or representative of, seven, of, of a thousand year period. Now the early Jews broke it down and we're gonna see this pattern redevelop when we talk about the length of man's days, three score and 10, four score by reason of strength. That the first 2000 years would be a time of chaos. Well, if you go to the 2,000 year mark after Adam, we come to Abraham. From Abraham to Christ, the next 2,000 years, they call the time of the law. And looking ahead, 
they surmise that the next 2,000 years on this side of the cross would be time of preparation for the coming of Messiah who would come to earth and reign and rule for a thousand years, considered the Sabbath rest. And just as the land was worked for 6,000 years and rested, the earth will work for 6,000 years and there'll be a 7,000th year of rest when God's redemptive work that he started with Adam comes to fruition. Now, when you understand that God lives outside of time and space, God actually wrote the Bible backwards. He knew the end from the beginning, and he declared the end from the beginning. So all he had to do was, was fill in the gaps because he knew what the end was. And in a very real sense, if we want to know about the end, we need to go back to Genesis chapter 1. Starting in verse 1. <clears throat> we see this play out again in a very dramatic way. A very real event that took place in the 6th chapter, in the 6th book of our Bible. The book of jo uh, Joshua. I'm going to read a few verses here and see if you can pick up on the image that God's creating. In verse 3 through 5, he tells the people, the, the Jews, they're, they're ready. They wandered for 40 years. Moses died in the wilderness. And Joshua, whose name, by the way, we... The Jews didn't pronounce the J's as we do. His name was actually Yeshua. And Jesus, his name in the Greek is actually pronounced, we don't pronounce the J, it's Yeshua. Okay? Isn't that interesting that these two men bear the same name? Joshua, Yeshua, and Jesus, Yeshua. Because Joshua is a picture, a composite picture of Jesus Christ. Because only he can bring people into the promised land. The law that Moses brought down from Sinai, but the law cannot get you to the promised land. So he died and handed the reins over to Yeshua, Joshua, one of only two people from the Exodus out of Egypt who made it into the promised land. The other person was named Caleb. And Caleb, the meaning of the name, means faithful. So Jesus is taking one person, the faithful one, and remember, there's one body of Christ that Jesus established. He made out of the two, the Jew and the Gentile, one new man, one body. Put him in one body, which is his church. So Jesus is leading one body from the original group into the promised land. And he has to cross the water to get there. And the first obstacle is Jericho, the stronghold, where the giants, the Nephilim, the Rehathim lived. It was said that the walls were so wide at the top they could run two chariots side by side, galloping at full speed with horses. So we go to chapter 6, verse 3. You shall march around the city, the city of Jericho, the gateway to the promised land, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow 
the trumpets, the shofar, the ram's horn. And it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. Now, we're going to have a study toward the end of the series about the seven festivals of Israel. And the fifth festival, <clears throat> which is uh, the Feast of Trumpets in September or October, has a very specific name. It's called Yom, Yom Teruah, which means to make a loud noise, a loud shout, blow the ram's horns. Very appropriate uh, name, Yom Teruah, for that specific day because it coincides with the instruction that Joshua told the people. He says, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. Skipping to verse 14. They did so for six days. Then it came about on the seventh day that they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Early in the morning, did you catch that? It came about that at the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua, Yeshua, said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city is a picture of heaven. This pattern is revealing when the resurrection, resurrection day, will take place. It's going to be sometime early on the morning of the seventh day or the seventh millennium. There's your picture, your prophetic picture of God's timeline. So the people shouted, verse 20, and the priests blew the trumpets, and it came about when the people heard the sound of the trumpet that the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, just like he said it would. So that the people went up into the city. Now we have a term in Greek for caught up. One of Paul's messages in Thessalonians will be caught up. The word is harpezo. Jerome, five centuries later, four or five centuries later, took the Greek manuscript and put it into Latin, Latin Vulgate. The word for, for harpezo was the word repturo. And there's a couple of derivatives. We get the English word anglicized rapturo as rapture. It's a snatching up with great force. It's transferring you from one place down here to another place. We're going up, just as the people were told, go up and take the city. I mean, we're not gonna be taking Jericho. We're gonna be taking over heaven where angels used to trump. Compare this to 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, and 1 Corinthians 15, 50 and 52. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede or go ahead of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven prefigured by Joshua with a shout with the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first go up 
then we who are alive and remain, our bodies will be changed. Paul says in Corinthians, our bodies will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That's an idiom for the feast of trumpets, Yom Teruah. We'll talk about that more when we get to that study. <clears throat> Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. The taking of the promised land was the foreshadowing of the church crossing over into heaven. The key takeaway here, don't dismiss this or lose this, is the timing. Early on the morning of the seventh day, when Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua, takes his people where? Up. Up into the promised land. <clears throat> the Bible is full of these symbolic parallels of who, what, when, how, where, when, why. Certain events will play out. As you're reading the Old Testament, be cognizant, be aware. Look for these patterns. They tell the story in a nutshell. In just a minute, we're going to be taking a break. When I come back, we're going to look at the count, six days and seven, from a different vantage point. We're going to go back 2,000 years to the cross of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that God has put a, put a different time stamp, but it corresponds with the other. It just depends on where you choose to start from. So we're going to go back and start from the cross 2,000 years ago. And we're going to see some other prophetic uh, signs of God's revealing the when. And that's what we're really trying to do. When did all this start? And we get there in our next video. Hope you've enjoyed this one. God bless. Marinara.